Beacon Radio presents The Craftwork Story, Part 1. With me at the moment, I have Ralph Hutter from Craftwork. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to Birmingham in England. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'd like to start off going right back to the beginning of Craftwork. Uh, we were just had a chat before we started the interview, and uh, you put me correct on uh, one of my points that I was going to make to you. Uh, concerning a van called organisation, I was under the impression that uh, you and Florian were you know, involved in the band. But uh, perhaps you could explain to me what the situation was with that band. We had a very uh, loose form of musicians playing together in Germany. And at one point uh, somebody recorded something in the studio, but it wasn't our project or anything. So really Kraftwerk started in uh, 1970 when we formed uh, our uh, Kling Klang studio in Düsseldorf. And we recorded there the first uh, Kraftwerk album when we kind of like produced ourselves. You know, everything we did was like self, uh, self-produced with an old Raybox machine and some tape recorders, feedback, and that's really when we started. Of course, when you formed Craftwork, it was just uh, you and Florian. Um, you called it Craftwork. Why did you choose that name? Because we just uh, had no idea of what to call call it name or something. We just kept looking around ourselves in the studio and saw all this electronic machinery, even small at that time, because we didn't have many things and then we thought well this has nothing to do with music it looks more like an electronic uh, plant or something so we choose uh, just the word craft work because uh, also we were very concerned uh, about our German identity like at that time it was uh, Germany was very much under the influence of Anglo-American uh, music culture which is still today but not so much anymore but at that time exclusively so that all the German bands at that time they had English names or American names which we didn't think was uh, correct for us to do so we had this Kling Klang studio and then we just took a German name from our mother language even many German fellow musicians at that time said we well you've you've gone crazy now they've completely Kraftwerk means uh, electrical energy or electrical uh, uh, power plant. Now, in 1972, here in the UK, uh, we saw the first album from Kraftwerk, which is simply called Kraftwerk. Obviously, at that time, you were one of the first electronic-sounding bands. Now, surely some of the equipment that you were using at that time uh, must be pretty dated now. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us... Uh, how much new equipment you have developed since Kraftwerk has been in existence? Well, the most important thing for us was always uh, the rhythms, because we had already um, Florian had a, like a, a pickup, and so he played like a because we we came initially from uh, semi-classical music because we were trained in that field, German classical music, and so Florian used to have uh, a flute with attached uh, pickups feedback and echo chambers and all this stuff and and I came from piano so I had of course obviously an electronic organ and also oscillators and uh, pickup microphones and all kinds and then we, we produced a lot of sounds with tapes the biggest problem we always had was with drummers because they were very much into the whole physical thing of gymnastics, you know. So, so we changed, I, I think every drummer who came to play with us from the area where we live, we had about 20 different and they wouldn't stay with us because we asked them to electrify, you know, to get, get away from this physical um, thing into electrical sound. They wouldn't do it, so one day we found ourselves standing there on our own, just the two of us, Ralph and Florian, that's we, and I just happened to have an old uh, rhythm box machine. So we started recording with that in 1971, and from that day on there was no no turning back. Uh, and we then, uh, when Wolfgang came in, he was the first uh, to really be open enough to play. And by that time we had developed either uh, the, the rhythm box playing automatically, or you could, uh, we had attached a special system so that you could also play manually. 
by closing circuits, electric circuits, and trigger off the electronic noises. And I think Wolfgang was the first uh, just came in and was open enough to play that stuff because the other drummers wouldn't touch that at that time. You know, it was a big taboo about just drummers seemed to be very, uh, at that time, seemed to be very reactionary, very much orientated towards, you know, historical things, with big drum sets and all kinds of hide themselves behind. Uh, and this electronic machinery, this special drum beat, I think has then been like a specialty maybe with us that we have developed over the years. Now we have a uh, the whole group is synchronized now. We, we can always um, synchronize ourselves into the rhythms. So we can either play it automatic or change the programs while they are running. The next album was called Ralph and Florian, uh, which was released in 1973. Uh, the titles on this album are still in German. Uh, is it right to assume that at that time, in 1973, you still considered yourself as more of a continental band? Well, we always uh, considered ourselves a German continental band. At that time, we introduced more voices into the... because at first we were very much still working on sounds, basic sounds, Klingklang in German, our studio, the, the name means Kling means uh, sounding sounds, so it's like a combination between yin and yang because we're, we were just like two people and sound and sounds. <laughs> and also in German it means this kind of metallical noise that met you make from Kling or from, you know, when two metals come together. So it was like our idea. And then we uh, introduced more voices uh, into the music, I think was the next step. And also we had been working there for the first time with Emil, who was a painter, and we did some more visual things. <laughs> Success in the UK and the States arrived with the album Autobahn. Could you tell us something about that? Yes, we uh, had done about uh, five years of touring in Germany in universities. You know, we played everywhere, Berlin, Hamburg. Uh, and every time we went from city to city, it was on the Autobahn. So <laughs> in my old grey Volkswagen, we had done about uh, 200,000 miles. So we just one day we had the idea while driving, well, why not record electrically or synthetically uh, make an album about what we really do is driving on the autobahn from city to city and that's how it came about the sounds of motors and tuning of motors and the whole mm, sounds of, of the wheels and uh, the landscape and then Emil made the picture for the cover I mean, they painted the picture and we, we even had our old grey Volkswagen on the picture of the album and when it came out just immediately it was played all over the radio especially in, I think in America, England, Germany and it just exploded. I don't know why, but maybe, maybe at that time was um, nobody had thought of, of doing that. I think uh, everybody was very much, I think, into uh, there was love songs and feelings, and we thought, okay, everybody's talking about that, so we haven't got much to say in this direction. We rather record something more uh, direct, realistically, sounds of the radio and the cars and. That's how we came about. Beacon Radio now presents part two of the Craftwork story. Now, after the success of uh, Autobahn, you replaced one of those people you just recruited with uh, Karl Bartos. Uh, wh wh what was happening behind this? Well, there was only one guy who just played, he didn't play on Autobahn. He just played on, I think, Midnight, he played uh, electrical violin. A guy called Klaus played electrical violin. He was only with us, I think, for one or two concerts in Hamburg. And he didn't want to stay with our group, so he, he, today he has, I think, somewhere he has a, uh, still into guitars and this kind of thing. And then uh, we just ran into Karl in Düsseldorf in some some nightclubs, and and he he came with us um, playing the second drums set of electronic drums and also keyboards. And then we went to America to do this like uh, concerts. And at this time, you also changed your record company as well. We were a little embarrassed all the time with the German record companies. At that time, they didn't understand where we were. They they were in Hamburg, which is a very reactionary German town, very much historically orientated. We come from Düsseldorf, which is like the center of the industrial German industry, you know. 
there are no record companies in Düsseldorf, so we um, we're always a little left to ourselves, and which I think is okay, because we organized ourselves very very much, so we manage ourselves and own studios, and has a lot to do with self productivity. You can take your own things in your own hands, you know. That's what we were about to produce with people collectively, uh, because we don't think we are um, music people or something. We are more like uh, workers in the musical field. We found a little more understanding when we changed with the record companies. After the success you had with the Waterbarn, uh, you you seem to have gone with Radioactivity, which was the next album, uh, slightly less commercial, particularly on side two. It's more technical with overlapping tapes and radio signals and such. I mean, would you agree with me? Well, musically, yes, because it was like our dedication to the age of radio, you know. We were always when we were boys listening to the late night radio of electronic music uh, coming from Cologne, which is Westdeutscher Rundfunk, you know, it's, it's about half an hour from Düsseldorf. And there, there was like one of the first electronic studios in the world. And they played a lot of late night programs with strange sounds and, you know, noise. And so it was like our dedication a little to the age of radio and radiation at the same time, breaking the taboo of uh, really including uh, everyday political themes into the music. Now, by 1977, Kraftwerk seems to have settled into a fairly stable lineup with you and Florian dealing with electronics and vocals, and Carl and Wolfgang on electronic percussion. Um, the next album was Trans Europe Express, and by this point, most of the vocals are now in English, and most of the uh, song titles are in English. First of all, I must say that we always record our albums in German in a studio, and then uh, we think uh, the albums are, uh, we see everything more like films. We are very close associated with uh, the new German cinema, some of the guys from Wenders and especially Fassbinder. And uh, we record the albums in German and then we uh, do like synchronized versions, like in films, you know. And we, we do not engage other people uh, from other countries to synchronize, like the actors do or filmmakers, but we synchronize ourselves. So works into into English and some, some we did in French. Uh, so the album you are getting here is the synchronized album. In, in Germany it's called Trans Europa Express and Schaufenster Puppen is showroom dummies and uh, the Hall of Mirrors is Spiegelsaal. So we do uh, for the different countries uh, different uh, versions. The original versions always in German and then we synchronize. How many different um, versions are there? I mean, do you do one in Japanese? Yes, on the latest album we did the Pocket Calculator song. We have some uh, friends in, from the uh, discotheque in Düsseldorf with this, uh, some Japanese friends. They help uh, translate it for us, Pocket Calculator, into Japanese. <laughs> After Trans Europe Express came the Man Machine album, which was a year later, and it seems with this one, as with your latest album, Computer World, there seems to be a central theme running through the songs. Were you at this point influenced by robots, or as you call them, Man Machines? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, we always had this uh, strong relationships uh, of ourselves with our music machines. You know, we are always plugged into uh, the electrical systems, and we are always uh, attached to our machinery. We produce uh, sounds with musical machines, sound machines. Most of the ideas we do, they come from our day-to-day -day experience. We don't look to the moon, outer space for inspiration or anything. We mostly look upon our work and ourselves and reflection of things we talk about that we seem to understand because we, we live with them. Uh, and to us it was quite direct to speak of uh, the man-machine because that's what we really are. It's the connection or the cooperation of man and machines because sometimes we play our machines and sometimes they play us, you know. It's like a dialogue. Sometimes we switch on certain automatic machines and they, they play very nice uh, music. We listen. We spend a lot of time listening also to our machines and then we change the programs and reset them. So it's like really an exchange of ideas between us two. That's what the man machine is about and also certain aspects in society where people are mechanically reproduced uh, 
or uh, bought and marketed models and our, our robots, which is the original uh, Russian thing, uh, Robotnik, means worker. That's really our identity, what we are. I can radio. Beacon Radio presents the Craftwork Story Part 3. Talking to Ralph from Craftwork about the current album Core cool Computer World. And as we mentioned last time, the album Man Machine had a theme running through it. And this album's the same. Uh, this time you're relating to computers, so perhaps we should start with the title track, which is Computer Worlds. I mean, maybe you could tell us something about this one and the idea behind the album. Yes, the idea is that we uh, had been working the last three years uh, since the Man Machine album uh, so uh, into making our studio uh, transportable. We wired everything new and we built most of the equipment put together ourselves with some standard components, of course, but most of the equipment we have is uh, self-made together with an engineer because we always found that uh, we had certain ideas for what we call software, musical software, but uh, then there wasn't the hardware available. You, you j we, we never found we could go into a shop and just find the right instruments for us. We had always certain ideas about how we should play and this and that. And then we we had to put a lot of work into building musical hardware. And we therefore we used a lot of micro microcomputers. And so it was also very um, direct for us to, to record a computer world because it's really everywhere around us. And it changed our whole attitude uh, of uh, producing sounds because uh, it has a lot to do with numbers and a lot of uh, how things are going to come down to uh, sounds, voltage controlled filters, voltage controlled oscillators, it all comes down to numbers, programming certain numbers and it just uh, started off a whole new uh, side of uh, our programming uh, uh, compositions a and then Realistically, we had just to record this album, Computer World. I think we couldn't have done anything else. A little while ago, you mentioned hardware and software. Maybe you'd like to explain to people what exactly you mean by this. Well, software, I think, is uh, in our context um, musical notes, numbers, filters, sounds, anything, or visuals, or anything. But in order to m put this across in, in ideas to other people, I mean, you can have something in your head that you imagine this sound or that sound, that's fine with me, I can do that in the studio, but if I want to play it and hear it from the loudspeaker, because we make loudspeaker music, then uh, technically I have to go to work, you know, I have to, and we, we work with an engineer now who is a friend of ours now, he's also within the group, he's called a D-Man, and another mathematician from the Society of Informatic in Germany. So he's normally doing another job, he's working, <laughs> and we just uh, taking up his complete uh, weekend spare time <laughs> by uh, making him uh, write certain programs. Florian has now a singing computer. Uh, we, we thought of these ideas, we had a lot of concepts, but in order to make it really come out of the loudspeaker, we have to get involved in hardware, rewiring the equipment and, and just uh, programming microcomputers and, and a whole stage set up because it's, it's fine to make something in the studio uh, overdub this and overdub that that's okay but if you want to do it in a one-to-one -one situation and we are taking so to speak our clink clunk studio on the stage the only thing we leave in Düsseldorf is the walls and we have about five doors there no telephone so we leave that at home and here we, we bring our studio and uh, that means hardware that's the physical side of, of musical programming so we have to take both, and I think they both have to be together. It's just uh, materialistic things and uh, immaterialistic things. They have to be together, programs and uh, apparatus. How much are computers now a part of craft work? We have uh, uh, the whole uh, rhythmic structures are now uh, computerized, and um, so we are have established certain programs, musical programs, but also we have access to the memory and we can change while it's playing, so it's not uh, just running, we can always change. We can alter the programs while they're being... Uh, so and it took us just the last three years. Every day we do about uh, eight to ten hour 
a shift in our studio. I think only uh, on Saturdays we uh, take uh, an evening off where we go to the cinema. The first single that's been released from the album uh, Computer World is Pocket Calculator. Now you've released numerous singles since Autobahn, but none of them seem to have had the impact that that the first one did. I mean, why do you think this is? I don't know. Maybe the singles are just like uh, short films, whereas the album are really what we are about. I think we put more emphasis into the album and the whole uh, concept of craftwork or the whole identity thing process and maybe people are just more interested into the whole uh, album thing but I cannot explain. The pocket calculator is interesting because uh, you do actually play it on pocket calculators and uh, I do notice that you happen to have one sitting on the table. Perhaps you could give us a, a little bit of a demonstration. I can play with some melody on this small pocket calculator. Let me just switch one. When you hold the microphone here I can play it. I'm the operator with my pocket calculator. Okay. That's absolutely amazing because uh, I'd, I'd never ever considered that you could uh, make a song out of a pocket calculator. I suppose there must be a lot of people around who don't realize how close music is to them if they yes, really want it's to. everywhere around. You just open your ears. We always say we have like two uh, stereo microphones in our ears and a little cassette recorder in our brain. When we're walking around the streets, that's how we came with Autobahn, radios and, and trains. And um, I mean, we just ha walked last, uh, last winter in the department stores in Düsseldorf. Most of the ideas we have, we get in the streets and everywhere. And we just seen uh, in the toy department some instruments and some... Because at one time we had all these computers, which are not so big, but still uh, they make us more into programming engineers uh, in a special situation where we have to stand still and be very attentive and not to miss the programs. But on the other hand, also we like to run around. And when we found those toy instruments and pocket calculators, then we are now mm, flexible. You know, we just wired to the equipment, but we can. Uh, we are more like now uh, flexible to walk and, and more micro micro music. Micro music. Now the whole development of craft has been fairly complex and by now sure there must be problems when you go on tour, as you say, you transport the whole studio now from Dusseldorf. I mean what sort of problems have you uh, come up against? Well it's it's not really big, it's very compact. We have everything now in compact uh, dimensions. It's in racks and uh, the really the hardest problem is that we only have everything once, you know, it's special built by us. So if something breaks or the truck just has an accident, we are out of work for quite some time because we cannot replace it, you know, we cannot go, if you break a guitar or a string or somewhere, you, you go into a shop and you get a new one. I mean, even if you have a, a specially built instrument, you can still replace it by a standard instrument. Some of the things we have, they are just once, you know, they are, they are products of our fantasy and and manual things. So um, we hope everything everything goes well, and um, so far everything has worked very very good. And um, our engineer is, is traveling with us, so when we check most of the machines in the afternoon, we should be okay. I mean, they're functioning pretty well because we treat them nice. You know, it's like. Uh, if you are uh, in a cooperative relationship with between men and machines, I think that shows also on the machines because they give that back to you. If you treat them just like uh, the latest, uh, the last uh, uh, garbage or dirt or, or just exploit them, then they will degrade, you know. It's more like uh, a new kind of relationship that you have to establish and then they give that back to you. And so far they haven't let us down on this tour. I read somewhere recently about a very elaborate 
plan that apparently you devised uh, concerning future tours. Um, in fact, it was uh, concerned with the transmission of holographic images. I, mean, I wonder if you could tell us something about this. It's still uh, very advanced because um, technically it's nearly possible or it's close to being possible, but still it's out of context in the moment, more like concepts. And we also have a lot of fictional concepts well, some of them we make realistic. At one time we played simultaneously in New York and Paris with the Man Machine album where we had uh, two sets of our duplicates simultaneously uh, presenting the new album to the media. And we were just like walking around, two of us in Paris and two of us in New York, talking to people while uh, our duplicates were presenting uh, the concept of the album to, to the media because uh, we believe in like industrial producing processes you know, processing programming uh, is uh, very much what we are concerned with physically we don't need to be everywhere at the same time we can certain aspects of our work can be functioning better when we for example uh, we have plastic duplicates and they can for example do very good photo sessions because they never blink their eyes and they can uh, be very static people can look at them for hours and hours and they will always be very uh, relaxed standing there very relaxed whereas we are sometimes very tense and we get nervous so we um, are doing then other things